Thank you, Vikas, and thank you, Shannon. It's really uh, exciting to be here with all of you today. I really enjoyed uh, the comments this morning. Uh, the healthcare paradox has had a huge impact on my work and, and our thinking in Camden. So I'm going to uh, use no slides today, so we'll have a conversation and, and leave plenty of time for, for uh, discussion afterwards. So the theme of my comments today is really about this journey to discover what is right care uh, and what is good care in the city of Camden. Uh, to give you a little bit of perspective, in Camden, uh, we're a city of 79,000 people. We're right across from Philadelphia, separated by the Delaware River. We're in New Jersey. Uh, it's the first, second, or third poorest city in the country, and one of the most dangerous cities in the country as well. We've been in various levels of takeover repeatedly by the state, uh, and it's also a fairly small place. We have one academic hospital. Uh, we have three emergency rooms. We have, really at this point, about 10 primary care offices. This is a pretty contained place. It's a place that you can really potentially get your hands around. My current role, I have two jobs. One is to be the executive director of a uh, citywide umbrella nonprofit uh, called the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers. And our goal is to bend the cost curve and improve quality for the entire city's healthcare system. We're focused on the quality, capacity, accessibility, and coordination of the local healthcare system. My other role is to be two days a week the medical director of the outpatient academic ambulatory offices at an academic health center, at, at, I'm sorry, an academic hospital. So that means 32,000 visits a year, 100 different doctors, 80 residents and fellows, uh, 23 different specialties. So that's our, the three ring circus where we train all of our future doctors. It's been a very, very painful job and I'm gonna be touching on some of the learning I've had from that. Uh, I thought it was gonna be an innovation project. It turned out to be a corporate turnaround where we ended up turning over 95% of the staff, all of the managers, all the leaders, uh, and uh, almost all the frontline staff in, in turning that around. So I arrived in uh, Camden 17 years ago as a newly minted family doctor. I had uh, trained in New Jersey in med school, I grew up in New Jersey, and I went to Seattle because I quickly recognized that New Jersey was not the place to train in family medicine. And, uh, and that uh, the view of family medicine in New Jersey was pretty truncated. I went to Seattle, learned full spectrum family medicine, and at that point in Seattle, um, you know, many of the best graduates coming out of the University of Washington were going into family medicine. Many of the leaders in my hospital system at Swedish were family docs, and there was a pretty broad view of the role of family medicine. I learned how to treat adults, uh, kids, deliver babies, so really full, full spectrum family medicine. And I moved from downtown Seattle to downtown Camden um, and decided that I was going to live where I worked. And uh, at that time, I was really pretty burned by the healthcare system. And, and, and even in Seattle, the sense of overtreatment um, was, was pretty profound. I got really into learning medical history and just realizing that we had not only been overtreating uh, in inaccurately treating people recently, but we'd been doing that for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, and there's some really some notable examples of that. So I was really going to hide as far away from the modern healthcare system as I could. And there's no place lower on the pecking order of the American healthcare system than being in a three exam room office in a poor neighborhood in the poorest city in the country, totally off the grid in Camden, New Jersey. So that was going to be my place to hide, uh, to be really, I guess, a refugee from the modern healthcare system. So uh, in some ways, I was prepared for what I was doing. Um, my patients loved the fact that they could come to one person. Poverty is really moms and kids in America. Uh, and that's very, very true for Camden as well. So um, my practice was uh, I was doing a couple of deliveries a month for about 10 years, doing home visits, had huge multi-generation families. I was in a, a Puerto Rican and Dominican neighborhood and um, uh, was, was having a wonderful uh, time doing that. When I first arrived there, I thought I had found a, um, uh, an, uh, an outbreak of a rare disease cluster. And I had all of these patients coming in who were, they, had, they were round in the middle, they had a moon face, they were kind of hunched over, they had what's called a buffalo hump, which is a fat pad on the back of their neck, they had lots of stretch marks on their belly, they looked much older than their stated age, they all had, um, elevated bad cholesterols, they were either diabetic or pre-diabetic, uh, they had lots of depression, and I thought I'd found uh, there's a disease in which your body has a tumor that makes uh, cortisol, which is your body's stress hormone. 
And if I gave everyone in this audience five milligrams of prednisone, which is a steroid, at the end of the year, you would look like my patients. You would be round, you would have stretch marks, you're, you would become diabetic or glucose intolerant, pre-diabetic, you're, you'd stop forming memories very well, your mood would get very labile, you wouldn't sleep well. Um, and uh, uh, so I began to do, there's a test that you do called a dexamethasone suppression test, and you give people, uh, you essentially check, uh, they check, they, um, you check their urine in the morning to find out if they had this, and I did you know, check after check, and I'm like, sure, I've got a really rare disease cluster here or something, and everyone was um, sort of normal in their test, and it started to dawn on me that I was taking care of incredibly stressed out people, and they hadn't just been stressed out for a day or a week or a month, but for years and years and years, that I couldn't tell how old people were, that there were folks, you know, I'd have to ask them their age, none of the visual cues for age made any sense, people were wearing out way earlier than they were supposed to wear out, that they had profound levels of chronic stress in their life, and they were living in a very stressful place. Moving from uh, downtown Camden to downtown Seattle was stressful. Um, the first three months I was unemployed because my uh, license got delayed. It takes a really long time in New Jersey to get your medical license. And they wouldn't let me start work until I had my medical license. So I was actually like, arrived in July, from July to October, I was unemployed in the poor city in America, wandering around the streets of Camden saying, what the fuck am I doing here? Yeah. And um, <laughs> I was saying, wow, this is a pretty intensely stressful place. Yeah. My wife and I used to, uh, at that time girlfriend, both of our parents were horrified that we'd move there. Um, we would just drive out of the city to like anything green just to get away from the concrete. And, uh, and just, um, you start to realize just the low grade stress level of being in a place like this. So one of, uh, so I pretty quickly learned that if there is right care, right care is really about ameliorating the effects of stress. I began to imagine my office as a giant spring. And I had people in really desperate straits and profound moments. And that my job was really to just listen, to engage, uh, understand, uh, and patch them back together and as best as I could get them on their way. Uh, that I was really part of a system ameliorating the impact of stress in this community. Uh, and that I was one of the very only stable things um, where people felt they walked in the waiting room, they were welcomed, we knew their name, um, I knew their whole family. Uh, that that was really about ameliorating the impact of stress. Pretty quickly realized how critical the role of my staff were, that my staff became the ambassadors to the community. We talk a lot about community health workers. My front desk staff and my medical assistants were the community health workers in my office. And they taught me a tremendous amount. But what I watched also is the vortex of chaos in the city constantly pulling them back. In the period of time, about 13 years of sort of being out on the front line, um, watch that vortex sweep them in and out of uh, just utter chaos. Uh, the one uh, thing I began to realize very well is that even if they had a high school diploma, it meant nothing. That I, I had staff that couldn't alphabetize correctly. Brilliant people. I had a staff member within a photographic memory who uh, now is a nurse anesthetist, but when we um, got her uh, into uh, the county college system, she like just basic grammar didn't have. Like just the fund of knowledge that people had, the degree of isolation was profound. Also, um, the violence constantly pulled them back in. So during our time, my front desk's staff member's sister was shot and killed three blocks from the office. It's like profound stuff going on, pulling the office in, sweeping our patients in, sweeping our staff in. Uh, I learned many years later that my uh, medical assistant was, uh, when her brother ended up in uh, jail, she had to carry on the family business, the, the drug business. So she was my incredible medical assistant during the day, and at night was doing her family duty to keep the um, drug business going. So, um, so I learned the, the value of, uh, of, of having my staff be ambassadors to city, the city, having them help me engage patients, and the sort of beginning of the ideas of what a team-based model could be. But I don't think I had the training, I didn't have the maturity to fully figure out that team-based model. I had glimmers of it and, and pieces of it, but I didn't know enough uh, about what I was doing. So I started to realize that right care, or good care, is team-based care, but I didn't know how to, how to make that team-based model. I didn't know how to fully engage my staff. 
Um, you know, I, much of the care was still focused on me. Much of the decision making was focused on me. Much of the emotional pain and, and angst of the patients was still focused on me. And I brought that home. The other thing I started to realize is that there were a lot of survivors, that I was um, seeing these huge families where a couple members of the family were drug addicts, might be homeless, and a couple of members of the family were like distinguished members of the community and were out with middle class jobs, had moved out of the city, had been highly successful, but had horrible survivor's guilt and just were re really ravaged by the stress of having only one or two family members make it out of poverty and have the rest of the family struggling with what that means um, and, and ended up taking care of those folks as well and learning a lot about their coping skills, their resilience, uh, and why some members of the family and the community made it out and some members of the, uh, didn't. And we'd often hold up the folks that make it out of poverty as, as heroes, and they don't feel like heroes. They feel like they've abandoned the rest of their family uh, as they've made it out. I began to get completely exhausted and overwhelmed by all this. And at some point, a couple of years in, was just ready to check out and leave. I just couldn't take it anymore. And um, I, had, um, I had really a scientist framework. I'd been an MD, PhD student. I had been focused on neuroscience research. I ended up leaving a lab, um, dabbling in public health, and then going into family medicine. And I didn't have the frameworks. None of this made any fucking sense. The history of it didn't make sense. Um, so as I dove deeper and deeper into the public health literature, the income inequality literature, trying to pull all this apart, um, one of the things that I think, you know, we talk a lot about social determinants. Um, and, you know, in Camden, you could use two frameworks. You could say that we need a Marxist revolution to eliminate income inequality, and that's the only thing that will fix this, that the determinant of poor health is income and income inequality in America. And until we fix this, all our efforts are hopeless. And for me, that was a pretty debilitating framework because I had no ability to do anything about anything about that in the city of Camden as a family doc sitting in a three exam room office. But a different framework would be that, um, that the social determinants are actually not determinants, they're correlates. So if you look at poverty, not every poor person has bad health. And poverty can lead to bad health, but bad health can actually lead to poverty. So let's look at homelessness. Not every homeless person is an overutilizer of health services. Not every overutilizer of health services is homeless. Mental health can certainly lead to poor health, but not everyone with mental health challenges ends up as unhealthy. And not everyone who's unhealthy or an overutilizer of services has mental health. So the, the problem with our frameworks and the problem with a determinist or even calling social determinants social determinants is that's a horrible frame. It's much like this you know, very locked in framework that until we fix all of income inequality, it's sort of hopeless and there's nothing we can do. These are actually correlates and they're bi-directional correlates and they're very complicated and we don't understand resilience, we don't understand who makes it out, we don't understand who doesn't, and we don't even begin to understand what we can do about all of this. So uh, I really pivoted at that moment and really began to feel like Poverty wasn't a lack of income. Poverty was a place of hopelessness where you were trapped by services that said that they were going to take care of you and actually harmed you every day. Harmed you every day. That's a different framework, and that's a framework that I could wrestle with. Because what I knew about America is America was a conveyor belt to lift immigrants that were incredibly poor out of poverty and move them into the middle class. And somehow in Camden, that conveyor belt wasn't working very well anymore. And as I looked around, I started to feel like really it was the services in the city that were holding people back. So as I thought more about right care, I felt like right care didn't even have a language. We didn't even have frameworks. The frameworks we were being given were actually um, debilitating framework frameworks in some sense. So that gave me some hope and kind of gave me a new lens to look out across all this. And I got absolutely obsessed with the police department and with city government. And that's not a good thing in Camden to be obsessed with. <laughs> So it turns out we have this great law in New Jersey called the Open Public Records Act, and you can request documents. And if your city government has been in takeover, and all the parts of city government have been takeover, the school district, police department, city government, there's an incredible paper trail. 
So I'm this kooky family doc in this little office trying to figure out poverty, and I'm now opering every document I can get about the history of Camden's takeover and all of these different systems being taken over. And the reason I'm doing that is that every day I've got people coming in, tears streaming down their face, telling me horrible stories about the police department planting evidence them, on them, beating them and their family members. As a member of the city, as someone living in the city, I'm watching the, uh, we'd walk down the waterfront every night and, uh, and you'd see police cars parked down there, like four or five police cars there for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Their girlfriends pulling up, their family members pulling up, like they may as well have gotten the barbecue out, like just utterly doing nothing. So, um, so that's one piece of it. The second piece is just how horribly run the school district was, just horrible stories coming in from my patients. You know, at one point a principal fondling a kid, um, a principal stealing trip money. So he was charging kids and families for the school trips for the kids when the school district was subsidizing the trips. I can't even fucking imagine a more horrible thing than a principal charging poor moms and kids to go to, like, to the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia and then pocketing the money. I mean, it's unimaginable. The, um, uh, the lunch lady stealing like lunch money. Like Every time you ever got a story, you're just like, really? Like, is this the point that we've sunk to in our, like, is, is this place broken down to that extent? Uh, and, uh, and just utter chaos in municipal government. So uh, the, uh, the police department had been taken over four or five times, school district taken over and over, a uh, huge takeover of the municipal government, and finally the state was going to do the takeover of all takeovers. They were going to put $175 million into the city, and they were going to put a chief operating officer in charge of the city, um, and take away the sovereignty of the uh, school district, uh, school board, and the city government, the uh, council. Um, and the local politicians ended up putting the former mayor in to do the takeover. I mean, just crazy shit. <laughs> so the, um, uh, so the, the final blow for me was uh, late one night. Um, I'm actually in the middle of putting my presentation together on income inequality and social capital and uh, all this wonderful international data and uh, shots ring out in the neighborhood and um, you know there's sort of a, a sort of a, a lot of black humor when you live in a place long enough and you know my dog's lying on the floor he looks up and I'm just sort of thinking you know we're not that many blocks from total chaos and you hear shots all the time and it's always is it firecrackers or is it gunshots and uh, so I went back to work and I get a ring a few moments later from neighbors and they're like come down there's a guy like shot here and the police aren't doing anything so I run up, and a huge crowd of my neighbors standing around, and there's a guy lying there, and there must be 15 police officers standing around. No one's doing anything. And it's an African-American guy lying with his, uh, on his side uh, next to a car that's been shot up. So start doing CPR on him. Uh, none of the officers offer to help. No one's done anything. Like, turn, turn him over, open his airway. Ambulance finally comes, load him up, and. I stood up and started screaming at the sergeant. I'm like, why didn't you guys do anything? Why didn't you do any seat? Why didn't you, why are you just standing around looking at him? He was still alive. And he said, we didn't want to dislodge the bullet. So that was sort of the final straw. I'm like, you, you guys are fucking assholes. I can't believe you don't do anything. So, um, so at that point ended up, uh, you know, doubling down on learning about the police department and, uh, did a whole lot of things through that period about um, pushing the police department to equip themselves to do CPR, learn CPR. I remember the, the thing I most remember that period of time is I thought it was scandalous. I went and talked to the papers about it. I'm like, these people are supposed to preserve and protect. That's what it says on the side of their car. And we're the most dangerous city in the country. That means there's people shot here all the time. We know that's, that first aid works. We know there's this very short period of time. We've got a world-class trauma center. Like, you get plenty of opportunity to practice, for God's sakes, just open people's airway. Like, just do something. Like, how can you just stand there? Um, so as I, as I got deeper into this, we got the police department to agree to buy equipment, to buy gloves, buy pocket masks, buy all the stuff. They stocked all the cars, they retrained all the officers, and no one did anything. And in fact, no one showed up at the trainings. And uh, so, so as I got deeper into the reports about the police department, 
there are 20 years of reports about the Canada Police Department that says that dispatch is broken, that training is broken, car repair is broken, that every single aspect of the department is broken. And, uh, uh, and that systems don't fail randomly. They fail for many boring reasons. And the school district, you read the reports, fails for the same reason. It's like accounting, it's HR, it's like all this boring stuff. Uh, in that on the front end, what that does is ends up being corruption and ends up being people hurt. But on the back end, it's just really poorly run stuff. It got me very interested in administrative data. And as part of this whole journey, I ended up uh, with a student uh, applying to the institutional research boards of Cooper, Lords, and Virtua and getting all of their hospital billing data. The reason we did that is that I knew we were the most dangerous city in the country, but I was fairly certain we were actually far more dangerous because no one was reporting their crimes to the police. I would take out staples from gunshot wounds of people who hadn't reported the crime to the police. So we managed to get all of the E codes, the accident and injury codes for every visit to the hospital, first from the trauma center and then the other hospitals, and found out as we mapped that data down to individual census tracts that the rate of assaults, people hurt coming to the emergency room, was one in 19 in a one year period for the census tract right next to the trauma center. Normally you count that stuff in like 10 in 100,000. Like just staggering levels of just day-to-day -day chaos and violence were occurring in the city. And I got really excited about administrative data. That administrative data and this Oprah data, all of that, you put that together, you can start to make a real story about what's going on. We also learned that um, in the data set, you could watch falls going on and you could map falls down to nursing homes and that there was an unbelievable variable rate of falls by nursing home. And that one nursing home had a staggeringly ridiculous rate of falls. And it went way up over a couple of period and then went way back down. And I knew enough locally to know that they had had a management turnover. And you know, like someone should have intervened in that. So once again, administrative data can find the stories and begin to tell the stories. As we assembled the full data set and we got all of the claims data, um, by that time, I had broken off from the hospital and had a private three-exam room office taking care of Medicaid patients, which is a terrible business model. <laughs> a really bad business model. And Medicaid kept cutting my rates down to $19 to $35 a visit. And at the same time, I got this massive claims data set. So here's big data. We've got it on two $50 hard drives with three, now four years of claims data for every Camden resident across all three hospitals locked in a safe under my desk. And we take the hard drive out, we plug it into a sterile computer not connected to the internet, and we use Microsoft Access and a whole bunch of students to analyze the data. So that's, that's big data. And I'm looking at this data and I'm like, holy cow, we're spending $100 million a year just for emergency room and hospital care, and I can't even keep my office open? The number one reason to go to a hospital in Camden is head colds. Right now, today, last year, 4,000 people had head colds, 4,800 visits, $1.5 million in receipts, payments to Cooper, Lors, and Durf Virtua to treat head colds. That would be enough to reopen my boarded up office, to open up five, six, seven of them. That would increase the primary care supply in Camden by at least 10 to 15%. So, you know, it started to tell the story once again, same lesson I'd learned before, that, you know, the systems fail in the details, and they fail in all of these micro failures that are occurring, but that you can explain this by getting the underlying administrative data and beginning to put the story together. So I want to bring this back to right care and sort of what I've, uh, what I've learned about right care. So, my response to this data set was to do community organizing. And my community was grumpy primary care docs who have failing primary care offices. And that's, that's my tribe. And they were all like 80 in Camden. And then me. So we decided to have a breakfast group. And literally, we got together and had breakfast for about three years. And one doc was 75. Um, another doc was, I mean, really, you know, they came and told me about like doing, you know, 15 cent home visits back 50 years ago. I mean, just unbelievable stories about the history of medicine in the city. That became the Camden Coalition of Health Providers. We had no idea that anyone was ever going to give a shit about what we were doing or even have ever heard of us. Um, you know, so that was community organizing in my tribe. We eventually brought on hospitals, behavioral health, addiction, the whole crazy alphabet soup. The last group we brought in were patients because I was so embarrassed by my colleagues. And it's really hard to engage patients meaningfully in such technical discussions. 
as co-equals. We had to really think hard about how to do that. We engaged a group called Camden Churches Organized for People. We engaged AARP. Uh, we now have a 30-member patient community advisory committee that meets once a month with a whole set of officers. They elect representatives onto our board, so they have very meaningful engagement. My board secretary for the last six years is someone who uh, is a patient, has been very involved in our work. So I want to sort of round out this discussion about um, what's, what's right care. And for me, that's really been a, uh, an exploration of what's the problem we're trying to solve. I keep going back to, it's not about answers, it's asking better and better questions. And, um, I, and I had no idea how many lids I would end up pulling up, uh, up on this question. So at first, I really thought that right care, you know, as I looked at the data and I saw the outliers, I saw how much money we we're spending on them, we were like, we're going to run out in the community and fix this problem. So I originally thought it was a problem of navigation, coordination, engagement, accompaniment, and education. And we built a high velocity, perfect model for, not perfect, but we, we've got a really good model. We got, we've been working on that for like 10 years. We're, we're getting pretty good at that piece. That didn't fix it. Fixes it for a small segment of folks where that's really the barrier. And that's really important. So I don't want to downplay that as an accomplishment or that as a key piece of learning. There are definitely a segment of folks that are just waiting for someone to help them navigate the complexity. The next piece we explored was, you know, maybe this is really about data sharing, data analysis. We built an HIE. We used the HIE in real time to target our intervention. Uh, we have massive claims data sets and other data sets. I thought it was a coalition building. You know, if we were going to navigate across systems, if we just coalition build and brought people in, that would help solve it. We have a very sophisticated model. We re-elect our board, executive committee, and officers every year. For 13 years, we've made decisions by consensus. So I mean, we, we're, we, we thought about the game theory of shifting from competition to collaboration and built a governance model over 13 years to do that. Coalition building alone will not solve this. We thought that this was a payment reform problem, and we ran around the state and passed legislation. So five years ago, we passed a bill that created a community-based Medicaid accountable care model that said instead of a hospital framework, a community model with community governance, a community board, 100% participation, it allows you to capture shared savings. And we've got United and Horizon, our two Medicaid payers, deeply in that model. That framing didn't fix this either. What it did is accelerate my ability to do navigation, coordination, engagement, accompaniment, and education, but it didn't cure the ills. There's still huge segments of patients not getting good care. So the next piece that we sort of lifted up here and, um, and began to think about was when I dove into the Cooper work, which was the idea of what would it take to, f as, I, as I, I began to realize that we were navigating people to nowhere we were navigating them to completely broken, failed, and poorly run services. And that could actually be harming them, right? That's a pretty, pretty challenging idea. So then I'm like, well, why don't we just, you know, why don't we just go fix that damn clinic at Cooper and see what happens? Well, you know, three and a half years later, it's not an innovation project, it's a corporate turnaround. I mean, what would it mean if you had to turn over 95% of the staff at every academic center in the country? Like, that's unworkable. Um, we, we went to India and studied the Aravind model, a very famous eye hospital in India, and have spent a ton of time doing protocolization, standardization, task shifting, really rethinking basic elements. So we are using LPNs now to task shift and protocolize as many things as we can protocolize. So I'm letting LPNs start and titrate blood pressure medicine and insulin, and we're going to let them, I think 95% of what primary care doctors do and specialists can all be task shifted and delegated and done better, frankly, by LPNs. Because the great thing about LPNs is they follow the protocol. And then you can change the protocol if it's the wrong protocol. And you can have plans if people fall out of the protocol. But I don't think that's fully solved the problem. So the next layer to pull up in right care was really, um, is really the recognition that a lot, a lot of us talk about how we integrate primary care, mental health, addiction, and housing. Uh, we are knee deep right now, very much influenced by the Healthcare Paradox book in housing. So we, we stopped everything inside of our organization, got 50 Section 8 vouchers from the state of New Jersey, raised 750,000 in earmarks and wraparound dollars, and we are moving the most complicated people I've ever met, medically complicated with active addiction, mental health issues, um, 
many of which were living in tents and living on benches. We had an 80-year-old living on a bench out in front of Cooper Hospital, moving them into brand new apartments with tons of wraparound. That's, been the, that's the closest I've ever gotten to right care in my full 17 years in Camden. It makes me want to stop prescribing medicine. It makes me want to hang out my stethoscope and stop doing what we're doing. If you have an 80-year-old living on a park bench, nothing you do will make a difference until they're safe. This is really about safety. The other piece of this is that if you're many, 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 many of the patients that we work with, we have learned in, in a lot of different ways that they have had horrible life circumstances and have had severe trauma in childhood. They have had physical and sexual abuse. They have had maltreatment and neglect in ways and levels that you could never imagine, hard to even understand. And they've hit 40 and 50, and they are falling apart. They died 20 years before the rest of us. And homelessness is not random lightning striking. For the chronically homeless, they have had severe physical and sexual abuse. Lots of things happen to them. They don't form trusting relationships. The addiction, the mental health are symptomatic of these profound things that have happened to them, have happened to them. Putting them in homeless shelters doesn't work. Take someone who's had that happen to them and put them in a room with cots with 70 other people who've all had similar kinds of trauma and that's terrifying. They would rather live in a tent or on a bench and have some sense of locus of control. So shelters fail. They only succeed about 20 to 30% of the time. Housing first succeeds 90% of the time. So when I, when I pull the lid off of our modern addiction system, it fails. It has a lot of the wrong constructs in it. When you pull, uh, it, you know, it's not harm reduction based, it's sobriety based. When you pull the lid off of mental health, it's medication focused, it's not well balanced, it's disability focused. There are glimmers in addiction, there are glimmers in mental health of what the new models are gonna look like. And primary care is utterly failing. We run from room to room to room in meaningless increments of meaningless 15-minute visits. So uh, this is going to be not just integration. I've found reconstruction of the mental model and the delivery of addiction services, mental health services, primary care, and housing. And all of us are old school. We've all been trained wrong. We actually don't know how to do this. We don't even have the glimmers in the beginning of it. When I actually look at what we do every day, if you actually look at what people do inside of addiction, inside of mental health, inside of primary care, and inside of housing, there's almost no difference. You know, if you were going to try a vet, you know, you're going to sort things and sort things that all look like one another, you wouldn't, primary care wouldn't be in the house of medicine. It would actually be over here. It looks a lot more like mental health and addiction and housing than it looks like taking someone's appendix out. So that's going to be some rethinking of our basic constructs. Right care is going to be pulling us out of the house of medicine and moving us over um, into another part and rethinking where, where we belong. So my, my last piece of all this is sort of what, what right care is, is, um, is really this piece about early life trauma. So I just want to show hands how many people know what the ACE study is, ACE study. So I'm really sad to say that um, in most rooms, 5, 10, 15 people raise their hand. And even in really large rooms that are about accountable care and population health. So the ACE study was done 15 years ago by a guy named Felitti, a whole team of folks at Kaiser Permanente, sent out a survey to about 15,000 middle class people. 70% of them returned the survey. And they asked them 10 questions, 10 standard questions about all the horrible shit that happened to them as a kid death of a parent, physical abuse, sexual abuse, divorce, maltreatment, neglect, a whole variety of things, one parent hitting another. The existence, not the severity or the number of times, just the existence of saying yes in those categories adds up to a point score. Very easy to administer. It's now been administered in many, many places around the country. That is the best predictor we still have for healthcare spending, healthcare utilization, obesity, substance abuse, for um, uh, alcohol, for smoking, for uh, early uh, pregnancy, for probably incarceration and chron chronic homelessness. That when you are traumatized at an early age, you actually get rewired. There's a new and different kind of uh, uh, brain chemistry and brain wiring that does happen. And it's adaptive, it's a good thing. Your brain gets rewired not to trust other people. That's a pretty adaptive response. The problem is that modern society is about reciprocal relationships of trust. 
And if you're taught not to trust other people at a really young age, it's hard to have a stable marriage, raise your kids, and navigate the world. The modern world is a very hard place to navigate. It's hard to hold a job. You're going to underreact and overreact to things. So we have employees like that in our healthcare system. We have leaders that behave that way, right? And we have patients that are, um, have had these experiences. So the, the folks over in the ACE world are trying to teach us something, and they're trying to tell us to stop asking what's the matter with you and asking what happened to you. They have a whole pedagogy and curriculum and new thinking about this. So, um, so right care for me is going to be a much deeper understanding about trauma-informed care, the role of trauma and how we deliver care, the role of trauma in our own lives, how we were raised, how we have transference and counter-transference, all this complex stuff going on in caregiving, care-seeking, and care-taking. And it's also going to require a, a really a re-understanding of attachment theory, because I think attachment theory is really the much broader lens upon which healthcare is operating. Um, and I don't think we have time to fully dive into that right now, but let me, let me pause on that point. So let me, let me close by saying that um, I still don't know what right care is. I'm getting closer to it, and right care is something about care and about attachment, about the impact of trauma in people's lives, about how we interact with each other as health professionals, and how we construct our systems. And uh, I'll let you know when I figure it out, and I hope um, I, I hope in my lifetime we see us all figure this out. So, thanks. Wow.